from early research on cover crops in dryland situations to a cold turkey approach to going regenerative and a farm that was regenerative organic all of them seem to have thrived on early success but then things changed those themes came up in the news that i looked at this month and i'll cover those stories plus some other ones in this episode of the podcast hi my name is scott gillespie of plants dig soil the name of the podcast and the consulting company we're an independent agronomy company we do not sell products we provide advice only we focus on realistic regen ag, which has to be proven and profitable. We work in person or remote or a combination of the two. Our pricing is set to be affordable to anyone from a Q&A package to full farm planning. There's no long-term commitments. You can retain our services, do it yourself or hire others. Of course, we always love to work with people over the long term. So the first article that I want to highlight is one called Water Use Limitations of Cover Crops in Dryland Cropping by Andy McGuire out of Washington State. He starts out by talking about how early research when he was doing his graduate studies showed that you could have cover crops in dryland situations, but it only worked when there was a wet winter or enough precipitation so later research or as research went on and especially through the droughts of the past um, few years or decades it doesn't work out as well as it thought they originally thought it would look like that no matter what you do you are going to have problems trying to get cover crops to work in dry land uh, there is an interesting number that i hadn't seen before 27 inches of precipitation in a year is what is needed to make it work. For context, the area that I live in gets about 12 to 14 inches of precipitation over the entire year. So it's going to be a struggle to make something like this work. I encourage you to read the entire article because it goes through it in very good detail. But the main thing to think about is that water goes either very deep below the rooting zone to recharge aquifers. It gets stored in the root zone, so in the soil. It could run off. Um, and then it either gets evaporated off the soil surface or it goes through the plant. So if you plant something when you can't grow a cash crop and the net use of water is the same, whether you've left the the ground bare or used it um, through a plant that's going to make the difference as to whether it works or not and he goes through a lot of research and studies um, yes over time putting cover crops in will increase your infiltration but you still need the water and you still need to work make the system pay so highly encourage you to read this it um it puts some caution on trying to get cover crops to work in every situation. And it's something I've talked about a lot in the podcast, and it is backed up by science. Now, as it happened this month, there's another article that has come out that puts caution on just going into cover crops, cold turkey. The Noble Research Institute went into it by uh, going completely, switching it into a completely new system. Now, they had very good success early on, and um, they had excellent growth. It looked really good, and the person running the, the farm said everything grew well. We thought, well, this is easy. It looked great. But then the next year came, and it was drier. So, of course, um, that is a factor, but he thinks that the bigger factor was that that first year they were using a lot of the residual nutrients in the soil, and then when they came back the next year, they were gone or they were at low levels. Now, I have spoken about this a lot before, in uh, especially in my Three Pillars of Propping Regenerative Egg podcast episode, where I do talk about this, where initial success... Um, is probably built on nutrient reserves and not on cover crops magically taking up the 
or, or creating new nutrients out of the soil. They also talk about using the Haney soil test to come up with the cover crops that they thought they needed. Um, I have heard of this, though I've never been able to quite figure it out myself. And I think this is where some of the research is lacking. There are ideas on how things could work, um, but in reality, sometimes they don't quite work out the way it is expected. And I think they talked about that the NPK are low on the Haney test. Well, any soil test is going to show you that too. Um, so if you're low on the main nutrients, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, he says that the cover crops, plants grow very slow where the fertility is really low. And um, to me, I'm just thinking, yes, of course, that's going to happen. Um, you need the fertility there for, for things to grow. Um, they're not just magical and that they're going to work. Um, and something interesting, and I have talked about this in the podcast a lot in the past, and it's showing up again. Um, he's going to trim back his warm season mix to three or four grasses that he knows will grow well um, oh and also a legume or two but he's paring it down he's not putting in a big cocktail mix anymore he's learning what's working and he's using that so I think this is where again putting some caution into things where we don't just automatically throw everything at it um, we pick what the winners are or we pick the best ones and use those so again very good article and I'll link that for you to read later and just to complete these three main topics that I talked about at the beginning of the podcast, something really interesting, two things kind of came together that I saw this week that, uh, or this month that, that really um, piqued my interest and it was interesting with their timings. Um, the regenerative organic certified system is gaining momentum and I've been hearing about it more and more. So this is a way for organic to try to capture the regenerative market and not lose their foothold in um, in the premium price or the premium market. Um, so it takes organic to a whole different level. And I just want to touch on what um, they have here as the, the three pillars of it is soil health, animal welfare, and social fairness. So these are all excellent things to be doing, but of course they do add more complexity and they do add more burden on the farm to come up with this stuff um, now it's interesting there's no confined animal feedlots I'm not sure if that's um, just regenerative organic or or organic can have that too um, but there has to be some way if you're going to be bringing manure back into the system uh, confined systems even if they're small scaled have to be part of it so I'm I'm interested to see how this could work because, um, again, it's about nutrient flows. If the the nutrients are ultimately going to the humans, um, and if that's not coming back into the system, we're losing them, especially when we send things overseas, uh, which is most of the prairie agriculture ends up overseas or long distances away from, from the farm. Now, what was fascinating is that this story or this, um, I came across the regenerative organic system or a little bit more of it um, just recently. But then as I see that, and as there seems to be momentum in it, um, a large regenerative organic farm is being sold because the company that had bought it is walking away from it or or at least is... is uh, well, they're, they're divesting themselves of it. Um, it's called Nature's Path. They have many different foods out there in the marketplace. Um, and they had bought this farm and they had um, made it regenerative organic and they were going to make it as a big flagship part of their brand. But um, someone noticed that it was on the auction block. Um, there hasn't been much public comment on it, but it seems like the business side isn't working out so it's curious um, we'll keep an eye on this and you can also read the article that I'll link in here so it fits in with this theme that I have seen as I was looking across the articles for this month is that a lot of things can start out with great fanfare and great success and great pictures um, 
but they a lot of times don't sustain and this is where to me this is where realistic regen ag fits in this is what i've been talking about for a long time and i also have my own community now where we talk about this um is that um we need to get things that are going to work for the long term While we're on the business side of it, there's an article from NPR about the pressure that investors are putting on large corporations to act on climate change. And I think this is an important read for farmers and agronomists and anybody in the food industry to understand is that they are getting pushed to do these changes that they may not necessarily want to do. But the food companies that are buying the stuff that they produce are getting pressure from their shareholders. Um, and then the shareholders are the ones that are acting on what they see as consumer interest or they're getting their their money or their ideas from somewhere. So it's pushing down the line. And I think it's an important thing to understand. Now, farmers are finding agronomic ways that these are paying, and I think as an alternative or as the other side of this, it's not just a pressure to do things because shareholders want things. I think there's ways that these um, regenerative systems are helping farmers. But then the other side of it is sometimes the business side doesn't catch up when you're in the risky part of it. Um, so another interesting one, um, I came across this through Shane Thomas's um, Upstream Ag newsletter that comes out every Sunday. Uh, crop insurance is looking at starting to cover intercrops. Um, there's already a way that Saskatchewan has made it work, um, but you can only have up to 30% of your acres intercropped. But as the work out of um, the Southeast Research Farm run by Lana Shaw um, is showing, um, when these systems are more stable, then the insurance should should reflect this. So um, very interesting and very encouraging for what I think is going to be a way to help get more people into regenerative systems. Also from Shane Thomas was a deep dive on biostimulants, and he has went through a big farmer survey of who's using them, who's not, uh, where they're seeing successes. Um, and what's interesting, first of all, he only looked at the U.S. data. Um, there's a lot more data for the U.S. and there's a lot more use in the U.S. And I think it's because they're primarily being targeted at corn and soybean acres. Um, now, his he had some interesting comments uh, or an interesting insight here is that they're getting close to crossing the chasm. Um, so when you have something new... You have innovators, which are very small. You have early adopters, which are a small segment. But then the early majority is when things really take off. So he thinks they're getting close there. However, there are some problems is that the satisfaction with them is still lower than conventional in a lot of things. And I think it's because they don't have as great of a consistency across their use. So... Um, it's hard to say whether we're going to see a big change over the next few years or whether we kind of hit a peak and then they're going to fall off again. Um, if you've listened to me for long enough, you know that I'm still very skeptical of them because I think there's still a lot of work that needs to show where they fit in and where they don't. And there is local work here in Alberta, um, in southern Alberta, um, that is showing how how and where these fit. And I'll be brave be able to talk to you more about that as I see the research results. So let's talk some actual agronomy in here. I have talked about this, about using marginal land to be your insect refuges. And there's some good work that is coming out of um, the University of Guelph on using um, what they call prairie strips, which I was trying to figure out where the prairie is in, in Ontario, but um, they were referring to it there. Um, but um, where they took parts of the land that are not economically producing and putting it into these systems, they can very quickly build up the diversity and the, the beneficial in, uh, insects, um, pollinators, 
can show up very, very fast. Um, so you don't need a lot of this in your, in your farm um, to have the benefit. And um, so I think it's, it's interesting research and it's backing up that there are a lot of things that we can do. There's low hanging fruit out there. Um, where I work in Southern Alberta with irrigation pivots, we're already fairly close in this because pivots always miss the dry corners. Even the best ones will, even with corner arm systems, will miss some. So there's lots of lots of work that we can do, um, and maybe we already are doing that that can help um, encourage these natural areas. I've talked about mustard being used as a biofumigant in potatoes, and one of the biggest issues with it is the concern of seed set. Um, beyond the fact that it takes a whole year out of production. So if you're going to use it, you want to be sure that you're not going to end up with mustard in your potato crop or mustard as a weed. Um, there's a new company that's working on a way to make it sterile um, so that it still grows, but it just doesn't make seed. Um, and then um, there's almost no risk other than seed that doesn't germinate. Um, of it becoming a problem in the crop. So this is a this could be a big game changer for use in potato systems. Um, and even in, especially in my area where seed canola is a huge crop, um, if you can put something out there that's never gonna be a problem for the seed canola and get the benefits for your potato production, I think this is gonna be a great, great fit. Now as less and less chemicals are being re-registered or being taken off the market or are being found to develop resistance to the things that we're trying to control. There's a lot of work in trying to control pests without them. Um, one of the ones I came across here was this article, Onion Maggot Management Without Chlorpyrifos. Um, and they go over a lot of the really, the, the, the problems that you can have when you're looking at alternatives. So. Um, disking in the crop residue is a good way to to lower the disease risk, but of course that exposes the soil to erosion, um, and onions do not leave much behind. Um, floating row covers work in high-value small crops, but not at field scales. Um, and keeping your fields many kilometers apart, that could work if you live in a small area, uh, or in um, if you're in a in a sparsely populated area, but that's very hard when your neighbors could be planting something nearby you. Um, there has been some work on beneficial nematodes, but it doesn't appear that they seem to work. Um, there's also, and, and this was the focus of the article, a sterile male onion maggot flies that go in and uh, will um, control the pest, but not become a problem themselves. Um, it seems to work, but what they're saying and what the article is talking about is that if only you are doing this, it's probably not going to have much of an impact because the flies can just come over from neighboring fields. So this is one of those things when scaling up things that it's sometimes it's going to it's going to be tough because it takes a community effort to work on this rather than individual decisions. So an interesting article looking at pest control in regenerative systems. And something very similar, there's a potato vine crusher that works to control European corn borer, but it, they're also working at looking at things where it can uh, control some of the weed seeds too. The problem is, again, with this corn borer, you could control it in your field, but they'll just move in from other fields. So. Again, um, this is one of the challenges in insect management is that, and disease management, is sometimes they, they move around a community fast that there's not a lot an individual can do. Um, but again, it's, it's encouraging, and I think maybe as many people start picking these things up, there are some potentials in the future. Now I'm just going to end on one where it is something that you can do in your field though of course i guess now that i think about it this is talking about kochia and kochia can blow in from a neighbor's field pretty easily so um, maybe it's not going to work as well as i thought um, but it was looking at different ways that you can control kochia culturally um, the biggest thing they found was reducing row spacing and doubling seeding rates was able to reduce kochia biomass 
by as much as a typical herbicide usually would. Now, my immediate thoughts in this is why not keep the wider rows and then um, put a, a use some tillage in between the rows and put a cover crop or interseed a cover crop in there. You will probably have a little less cash crop, but maybe this is a way to make a cover crop work at the same time in a dryland system or even in an irrigated system. Um, so there's lots of interesting things that we can do. Um, and they're showing that I guess the more cover you have on the land, the more you can push out weeds. So we can look at creative ways rather than maybe doubling our seeding rate or doubling the amount of iron we need. Maybe we can um, use our existing crops and then add in other things to, to make them work better. So that is a lot of regenerative ag news for this month. There was a lot to cover and I will talk to you again next week.